Uh, hello. Uh, we are uh, uh, presenting two cases of uh, bi-scriptural typeface design, uh, two typeface projects uh, developed in you know discussion with each other, Arabic and Latin. And uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is a uh, Arabic uh, two typefaces, uh, Picasso and Ada. And uh, Linda did uh, Latin for. And I did a Latin for um, uh, sorry Ada, and of course Pascal did Arabic for both. So the, both projects are initiated by Pascal. So it's not like Latin first. So it's almost uh, always simultaneous. So yeah, we'll start with uh, Okaso and Oscura. So the Ocaso project started uh, with a research in Spain about Alhumiado manuscripts, which are very old manuscripts found in in Spain that is Spanish written in Arabic and they are very unique kind of um, uh, kind of scripts because they use the Andalusian Kufi but in a very vernacular way so when I started researching this project I I had to find a way to analyze these kind of manuscripts and put myself in the mind of the person that was writing these manuscripts which were not uh, master calligraphers but uh, the people that were uh, living in Spain and try to decide how can I translate it into a modern typography. So we did an analysis of all the letters that we could find in these manuscripts, and we rapidly noticed that uh, there are so many different shapes for every letter, but the main characteristics is that most of the two categories is one of them is too geometric and the other is a bit more cursive. So instead of making one typeface, uh, uh, I said, why don't we do two typefaces? And then um, so that is sketching the different ideas. This is, for example, letter Ha, and trying to understand how was was it written and which flow, or how would be the real representation of it. And this is, for example, the Dal and the, and the Fa. And I was finding that there were some letter forms that are found in the manuscript that were not recorded previously in any Kufic, uh, any Kufic, uh, massive Kufic uh, forms. So at the end we had two, two typefaces, uh, uh, Arabic, uh, the, upper, the upper one is uh, Oscura, which is more cursive or rounded, and the lower one is Ocaso, which is more uh, based on geometry. You can see them here side by side. And the idea is that when you look at the manuscript and you look at the end result, you see that they're not a real revival of the, of the manuscripts, of course. They are an interpretation in a modern way uh, typography. So, but if you look at them, you can somehow feel the main essence, is, it, it is present. And, um, and uh, once I had an idea about the Arabic, uh, I contacted Linda for her to come up with the Latin counterpart. So, so Linda. So when Toshi approached me and told me about you know, the basic setup of the project, I really had no idea where this would end. You know, I didn't have a clear idea. So if you've ever been close to, you know, hitting the refresh button for type cooker recipe, this is how I felt that moment because I had really contradicting ingredients for the for the Latin at least. So um, I had a constructed Kufic and I had a handwritten source which is good and about you know lightly. So I went to look into what could Latin you know, answers be to those um, to those sources like the constructed Kufic, really constructed forms, and then also what would like non-scholar handwriting uh, be like a like formalized but not you know not you know done professionally. You know, I don't do I think it was a professional. But um, and then you also go down rabbit holes like uh, phonetical musical alphabets and things you find on your search on the side. Very lovely, but very so what looked very daunting at first ended in those two like two poles like Pascal said before a more constructive one and then a more fluid one almost in an upright like that way. And while working on it, <coughs> we had a lot of discussions or needed a lot of clearance on um, or a lot of dialogue on how to translate this oscuraness and ocasoness to this you know to my script and for both of them, you know, staying true to themselves, but also um, uh, sharing a lot of similarities or the same vibe. So I had to solve a lot of, and, and any of you that have been doing a Latin answer to another script has those questions, or Toshi had a lot of the same questions as this. 
um, like how do you you know deal with those very multiple vertical heights that we find in the Arabic and we don't have the Latin, like how, how long could I, for example, stretch the ascending and descending forms without the Latin starting to look ridiculous? Or how can, you know, how tiny can I go with the countless? And you'll see a more extreme example of that in Ada also later. Um, because Arabic can just do a lot more crazy stuff. And I found myself, you know, with a rather strange, you know, fence like Latin um, a lot of the time. Um, so how could the lively part look um, without being overly funny? Like, could an upright italic tradition be something um, for this one? And then Pascal came with the idea to make a matching slant to both poles of the project. So you could use a slanted secondary style to both of them. But I had an upright italic in the one style in the first place. I was like, oh boy, like, how, you know, how does that work together? And uh, but we found a way to, to make it also the question of which direction is that slant and like all of this. Um, and when I looked at this, the two, you know, the two scripts um, together, it was like we did a lot and it made me start to do unconventional or to me unconventional things in the Latin. Like for example, my, my caps are super small because I wanted, you know, really different heights for the <clears throat> for all my full music I can make forms. And but the caps if I wouldn't grow them in weight, once the weight increases, it look they look even tinier. Like going back now I, I thought I couldn't even grow them more. But this is something I wasn't used to be doing in that and I actually wonder why we couldn't do this more. But this was something, you know, of the small things. But I also did a lot of experiments <clears throat> trying to see what this kind of Arabic script bring me that could maybe you know, be fun to try in Latin. And um, one thing was to look at you know the form branches that come, that come from the initial, middle, and final um, variants that the Arabic comes with. So I drew, you know, I, I, this is our artificial introduction. It doesn't need this in the Latin. So I drew um, straight forms and round forms and started mixing them just to get a bit of more of this handwritten spontaneous into the super constructed um, setup. So I needed, I, I brought some contextual alternations, I needed to come up with my own rules, and I tend to want to change them every now and then when I use it like this, because this is artificial to me. But <clears throat> so I got, then you know, there's a bit of liveliness sprinkled in every now and then. The second thing I tried, and you can read a lot more about this on <coughs> Pascal's blog, there's like super nice articles about the whole project. We did a lot more experiments than that. It was to stretch the counters because I had looked at the at the manuscript and I was like, what are they doing? You know, what's happening with the cup here, for example? It can stretch like in in, in a crazy ways. So <clears throat> and I asked my, my Arabic expert to my uh, to my side saying like, is this something you you you, you, know, you can do? And I was like, yeah, it can be done to some letter stretching the counter. And then we tried it in the Arabic and we can actually use it for justifying lines. And then I also tried it in the Latin, it was quite fun. So I stretched the straight letters that I had, and then also the ligatures, and then also alternated them. So the FI is not true. So we also built the alternation in for it not to you know, look too boring and too silly. <coughs> so we ended up with a setup with a, you know, the way I think it's only normal to do. And ended up with a stretch axis that is actually when we see or custom use is this technique um, to stretch both the Latin and the and the Arabic. So uh, Ocaso was the was the exercise about how to translate an old manuscript into the modern uh, typographical fonts that you have nowadays with Arabic font and all of this. And uh, it was clear when I started working on this project, Ada, it was, uh, it was clear that uh, it's like the opposite extreme of what Ocaso was. So Ocaso was representing the Kufic scripts, which were the oldest scripts uh, in the Arabic uh, styles. We're not going to go in history, but it's one, one of the oldest. And uh, Ada is based on the Ruqa, which is somehow one of the latest that was developed at the end of the, during the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so, so this is like the opposite calligraphic cursive uh, style of uh, calligraphy in Arabic. Of course, the Nasalit is not a Persian style also. 
And it was clear that in this case, I would need uh, the help uh, or the consultancy of a, a master calligrapher to help me with it. I cannot, I cannot take the challenge to do it on my own. So I started looking at the Rukha, and in the, in the Rukha, what is really challenging is that you have to really understand what's happening with the baseline and what's happening with the letters and how they change depending on what happens before and after them. So I asked uh, the renowned, uh, so these are my uh, sketches before I, I consulted. So how would you take a certain Rukha and transform it into a modern day typography? Uh, how would uh, work with the contrast, with the, with the terminals, do a round version, a sharp version, a flat version, etc. And then I got in contact with uh, the renowned calligrapher and artist Hussam Shokat, and he was very, uh, I was pleased that he accepted to, to consult me on that. And the first thing we did is that he was advising on how we would translate also a ruka into different styles because most of the ruka that we see in manuscripts or most of the type the, the available uh, typefaces they were in medium or bold uh, styles there was not any light uh, many light versions of it so here we will see that we're making the exercise of how we would translate for example the wow the noon the ha and the meme especially that some uh, letters they have clotted counters and how we would we open them we would, we would need to come with new so there was a big uh, collaboration at the beginning uh, between me and Hussam and he, he was also uh, helping me understand how would, uh, for example, uh, how would a letter that comes before a meme drop down or, or, or a wow and how much will it drop less or not in order to keep the baseline. So there was all this um, understanding that I need to understand about the script before I start designing it. And then I started designing it and uh, of course, we some had to go in also the outlines and mark, mark it, like make it this bit sharp, it make this bit longer, or curve it in a more angular way. So, uh, so this was the work with the sum. So the first part of it, it was a collaboration between a calligrapher and a type designer. Um, and then, so we some was advising only on the sharp version. So at the end, we, uh, I said I want to make three versions of the typeface. So a sharp, a flat, and a round. Uh, and the idea was to make all of them as a variable font. But then we noticed that uh, the round will make so many problems if we put it in a variable font, so it was only sharp and, and, and flat. But uh, Wissam was very happy to consult me on the sharp version, but then he stopped. He said, no, I cannot do uh, about the sh flat, about the <laughs> flat, and that. You do whatever you do. I don't know what's going to be happening with it. I, uh, I, don't, I don't believe this should be done. <laughs> but you do it. <laughs> so I... But I had a very strong uh, base to start from. So, so then, um, so this is the sharp version, this is the flat version, and this is the round version. Uh, all of them, they share the same uh, skeleton, uh, the contrast changes and the terminal changes. And the main idea is that um, <coughs> the, the, the angle. So when you write uh, Ruka, the calligrapher can decide to have different angles maybe, depending on the word, and it can go between two to three angles, mm -hmm. degrees up to seven, eight, or whatever degrees. And so I made some testing, and after some testing, I had to go to the five degree angle. So the baseline stands five degree up, and also the stems are five degrees. And uh, also we, we tried to define how many levels we need to go down with the baseline, depending on the slant. So we see that we have a, a low level, a medium level, and a high level. So it depends what is letter that comes after and before it should drop down to keep the, the structure of the rukha and the works not to escalate uh, so much and to keep the base form happening. And, and the last part, we had to understand all the different uh, uh, forms that each letter can have uh, that will change depending also on if it comes in the beginning, at the middle, at the end, or if it comes before and after a specific letter. So what you see, all, all of these up, uh, they are only the base shape of the uh, ba tooth, the, the base of the ba or the non or the ta without any dots. It's the tooth, the teeth. And you can see below that all of these shapes, how they change depending on what's happening before and after them. And this is only one example. We applied this to all the letters that change. And then we applied contextual alternates uh, to make. So these are only two, two of the examples. So from all of these options, we're showing only two now. So the teeth that comes before the noon 
that will take this shape and it will make this letter combination or what we call ligature in, in Latin. And the, and the tooth and a hat will make this combination. And then the dot is added. So before, we need to work, work with the base forms before, and then we need to put the dots or the anchors. Um, and we were lucky that when we when when I decided to this this typeface that uh, the app that you're using, which is uh, Glyphs app, uh, they added new features like the conditional anchors and other anchors that we can use to make elevation marks and everything. And so usually before we only had the bottom top anchors and maybe the exit entry. It was also present for a while, but not very used. And and then we had extra technology that we can use. For the for the Arabic, so it made it much more easier to make a ruka within uh, within glyphs, and then uh, Toshi came in uh, to help me come make together uh, all this con contextual alternate uh, come together, and also to solve the problem of the kerning, which uh, what he created was called the, what we named the elevation <laughs> kerning. We didn't have the technology of graphite and wasm and all what they spoke about uh, the Google and Adobe people two days ago. We, but we were we were very proud to say that we did a very good result with the present technology nowadays, and Toshi is going to speak about it. Yeah. So actually, my first uh, part of this collaboration project is to write open type code for this. So before uh, doing Latin, well, actually after doing Latin, but anyway. <laughs> so the, this bit, the kerning is really tricky because in traditional kerning, you look at two characters side by side and decide kerning value. But that doesn't work because the next character might be very high, then the value should be really tight. So you need to figure out how high the following letter is in this case. Uh, this one. So uh, you need to start from the very end of the string and keep track of the height changes using uh, anchors and also hidden the non-spacing glyphs that we are treating as diacritics. So by you know, clever use of anchors, um, uh, those hidden glyphs and substitution, I can keep track of the height changes. <laughs> that way we can determine the uh, kerning value. So conceptually, you know, we're tightening this space. This is supposed to be one word, but it looks like two. The, but uh, right, uh, is, right example is more tightly spaced. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be super tight. It's still uh, quite a flexible and uh, forgiving system. Um, so that's what we did. So, I mean, yeah, the best effort example from the two days ago, and we were looking at, no, we've done better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we uh, also made a script that visualizes the uh, height of each letter, because otherwise they will be invisible in the final version. And for each height value, uh, each pair, we basically hand written every kerning value. So it's not easy, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, doing this. So yeah, all these yellow uh, gaps, those are you know, uh, gap in the one uh, one word. So these are uh, you know tightened now. This, by the way, it was actually um, uh, invented by Kamal Manso at Monotype. So it's not my invention. So even though you know we came up with a name. So yeah, I don't claim to own this idea. So yeah, this is how it looks, because we are now uh, separating dots and everything. We can color them uh, like this. And here comes the Latin design part. So when we uh, when I got a project, uh, a brief from, uh, sorry, not so long, uh, Pascal, uh, that was partly because I've done a look already. This is my uh, first uh, Ruka projects uh, called uh, Clackets, which I match the slab, uh, semi slab uh, surf design. This has more of a like a visual decision. Uh, but uh, Ruka is a really well established calligraphy style, it's with very clear and simple structure and well accepted uh, reputation. So, what is the Latin Greek equivalent of that? And in my mind, that was a humanistic hand. For example, this is it was Johnston's uh, foundation of hand. So I wanted to keep the similar kind of notion, uh, not just visual, but uh, yeah, similar kind of impression. And on the typeface front, I've looked at calligraphic typefaces like uh, Adrian Frutiger's Ondine. It's uh, like a semi, 
that maybe people have also kind of modern. And also what we shouldn't do, because you know, making a Latin based on other scripts, I mean this idea had already <laughs> always existed. It's just that it was not done better historically. So but you know, we are just only doing it in a more informed, a more a better communicated manner. So yeah, we need to just remind us of these things existed. <laughs> so it starts with uh, you know baseline and uh, stem you know parameters uh, as I did in Clacket, you know, because you shouldn't assume everything is horizontal and vertical. So I decided to go with a shadower, but still you know a similar kind of uh, treatment, which is left slanted uh, humanistic hand, which. Sounds blasphemous, but that means I'm doing something new, so that's great. Uh, so it is, yeah, shallower, but it looks kind of uh, single angle, and all the horizontals are, are slanting up. And based on the, uh, those parameters, I started, you know, designing the details. This is the first uh, iteration, uh, basically like a, a sans serif design, and I thought it was a bit uh, too bland. I wanted that uh, outstrokes like this and in strokes as well. So this is a full cursive uh, option. Eventually we decided to go with a like, semi-cursive style, but with more uh, softness uh, brought back from Rupa. So this is uh, the final uh, design of the in strokes and out strokes. So this is a semi-cursive behavior. It is, top, uh, it is simple on the top, like, like the reference symbol in the background, because Rupa's stems usually start, you know, without any decoration, but you know, it tends to have more slashes at the bottom, so I wanted to respect that kind of behavior. So yeah, this is how it looks uh, in different ways. This is a flat version. Um, like uh, Linda's uh, decision, I also made uh, Latin uh, chap heights, uh, also raising as, as it gets bolder, although this is more subtle, but yeah, in all cases, raising at a much higher rate. And also at Pascal's requests, I made a yeah, uh, Latin A and E, also the enclosed uh, counters version. These are stylistic set and you can, you know, turn on if you want to have fun. And I think it works uh, quite well. It looks more like Arabic, but you can still read it, of course. So, oh, I don't know what to expect with this. <laughs> so we were looking at two really, really different projects that both, yeah, so, uh, were um, came from different sources. So one, like for why we, for Ocaso and Oscura, had pretty much a wild card from those really crazy manuscripts, and we could have probably done like five hundred projects more out of those. Because if you get a chance to look at them, they're brilliant. And then uh, we looked at the. Um, like a Ruka inspired typeface that has comes with a lot more expectation. So um, the two projects turned into a scope that we um, that we didn't you know really expect it maybe when we take this took off or maybe also were advised not to do you know in the <laughs> different styles or something. Um, but um, we still had a lot of similar questions on the way and a lot of it was really nice preparing the talk actually talking to Toshi and Matt. Um, to, to, to see that we have similar um, similar things we were dealing with, like the question of, you know, does the other script and the, the logic of the other script uh, give me the challenges that I face in Latin, or is it the design of the script that actually that actually gives those questions? So we can only warn and recommend that kind of collaborative projects because we enjoyed it so much on the way, and uh, we just want to encourage to think a bit more outside the box. If I can add one, one more yeah. thing, um, there's some nice flyers there, so if you're interested and you don't have a copy, please take them, they are small posters. And uh, just, just also to end, I, I would like to say that working with Linda and Toshi and Bissam, it gave me new perspectives about stuff that I didn't know before. So for example, uh, with Linda we were experimenting the Arabic in a, in a new way and how it will affect the Latin. 
with Misam, I learned a lot about calligraphy, which I didn't know. I thought I knew a lot, but it's, it's showed that, that I didn't know much. And with Toshi, I learned a lot about new coding uh, techniques and archetype features. And it's really interesting to always work as a team, not 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 individually. So this it enriches so much each project. So I encourage everyone to work in teams and <laughs> share share your expertise. I'm not laughing first. <laughs> <laughs>